Thank you. Good morning. Bon dia. Ah, it's me. So, diagrams as code 2.0. Uh, this is a talk about software architecture diagrams specifically. Why are software architecture diagrams important? If you want to be agile, move fast, et cetera, et cetera, you need good communication for your team to move in the same general direction. Uh, and teams really need a ubiquitous language in which to do this. UML gives us a ubiquitous language to describe our architectures, to draw diagrams, et cetera, but many people have stopped using UML. Why? I've heard all the reasons. Like all of these reasons, teams have literally given me uh, as for reasons they don't use UML. Some of these are good, some of these are not so good. And so what you'll hear many people these days saying is, well, the value is in the conversation, just draw diagrams on a whiteboard. And of course, there is some benefit of doing this. I'm, I'm not saying that whiteboards are a bad approach, and I do use whiteboards myself for uh, upfront design exercises. Uh, but the problem here is there's no structure. Uh, and this isn't a tooling issue. If you go look up software architecture diagram on Google, you get stuff like this. And these diagrams kind of look nice, but there's no content behind them, really. So if teams don't want to use UML, where do we go? And really, this is my advice here. If you are going to use a boxes and lines style notation for drawing software architecture diagrams, make sure you do so with some degree of structure. And this is where my C4 model uh, for visualizing software architecture comes from. You can find more information online at c4model.com. The C4 model is essentially a hierarchical set of software architecture diagrams that allow you to tell different uh, levels of detail to different stories. Uh, sorry, different stories to different audiences at different levels of detail. Uh, and it's four levels of diagrams, context, containers, components, and code. And the concept here is diagrams as maps. So if you go into Google Maps and you want to find where I live, which is Jersey and Channel Islands, you can zoom straight in, you can zoom into Street View, or you can zoom out to get some context and figure out where Jersey sits. So yeah, it's a, it's a nested hierarchical set of architecture diagrams. I'm going to focus on two for the topic of this talk. The first one is called a system context diagram. And in order to draw a system context diagram for the system that you are working on, for example, you have to ask and answer, of course, these questions. Uh, what's the scope of the system we're building? What features sit inside our system? What features sit outside our system? Who are the different types of users, actors, roles, personas who might want to use your system? What sort of things are they doing? And what system integration points do you need to support? Answer these questions, and you can craft up something like this. So this is a system context diagram. Uh, for, in this case, a financial risk system. We've identified a couple of user types and a bunch of system integration points around the outside. So it's a nice high-level diagram, great for many audiences. To drop down to level two of the C4 model, what we do is we take that red box and we do the pinch to zoom movement, which I can't because I can't read it to the uh, screen, and we drop down to level two, a container diagram. And the container diagram kind of encourages you to ask a different set of questions. So what are the major technology building blocks how are we partitioning features across these things, so applications and data stores. This is what I mean by a container, not Docker, sorry. Uh, uh, what are responsibilities, and how do these things communicate at runtime? Answer these questions, and you can craft up something like this. So this is literally a zoom in of that red box in the previous diagram, and here we're showing the applications and the data stores that make up this solution. Got a couple of web apps, some data stores, some Java um, command line apps. The C4 model itself is notation independent. So that you can do the C4 model diagrams with boxes and arrows. You can use UML. You can use ArcuMate SysML. The notation is entirely up to you. And really, the concept behind the C4 model is abstractions first, notation second. So that's really to set the scene for the rest of this talk. Um, what we're here to discuss, of course, is tooling. How do we draw software architecture diagrams? What types of tooling do we use? Now, most people are still stuck with general purpose diagramming tools. Who's using general purpose diagramming tools here? Yeah, that's quite a few people. Visio, diagrams.net, draw.io, Lucidchart, et cetera, et cetera. Right, these tools are fabulous. They're very fantastic, sophisticated tools, but I don't recommend them for drawing software architecture diagrams. Why? Number one, you don't get any guidance. 
So these tools don't know you are creating a software architecture diagram, and they can't help you. So with the system context diagram from the C4 model, a system context diagram really just shows you people and software systems. If you're using a, a, a general purpose diagramming tool, you can add things like components to your system context diagram, which is kind of not really in the spirit of the C4 model. And the tool's not going to discourage you from doing that. A big problem is really that you're mixing content and presentation. This is something we stopped doing with HTML like 20 years ago or something. And when you export uh, these diagrams into text-based formats, they end up looking a lot like that. And you can't diff these things either. There's, there's a lot of stuff you can't do with these formats. These tools, again, they don't provide guidance. There's no consistency here. So something you'll notice here with the C4 model diagrams is that if you have a context diagram, when you zoom in to draw your container diagram, you end up copy-pasting elements across both of your diagrams because you're showing the same things on both diagrams, of course. It's very easy to start misnaming things. So you'll notice here the business user versus the report viewer. Maybe that's the same thing, but somebody renamed it once and didn't rename it twice. And that's an issue. As I said, it's hard to diff. We can't stick that in source code control and hope to figure out what change in the diagrams. It's impossible. And of course, you've got very limited opportunities for doing any automation. Sure, with things like draw.io, you can give it a CSV file, and it can create a diagram off that CSV file. Uh, but it's just kind of hard work. It just takes a long time. It's like it just takes a long time to draw these diagrams. When I was putting together these little example diagrams for this talk, what you can't see here is that arrow is not straight. It's like one pixel out either side, and you can't get it straight, and it's really annoying. And that's the sort of thing I, I don't want to have to be messing around with in tools like Visio. So back to October 2020, when we're all doing the pandemic thing, of course. Uh, diagrams as code as a, as a technique appeared on the ThoughtWorks tech radar. There's lots of diagrams as code tools out there that you might be familiar with, Plant, UML, Mermaid, uh, dot and graph is, there's a, a tool called Diagrams, which is a Python-based tool, and something called the Structurizer DSL, which is what I'm going to talk to you about. So Diagrams as code is essentially, rather than using a drag and drop editor to craft, to craft up your diagram, you write some text, you write some, some code, and then a tool will generate your diagram from that definition. This is fabulous because it's text, we can version control these things. We can diff them so we can see the differences between versions of diagrams. Uh, we can use our IDEs to collaborate and do global search replaces. And we can integrate these tool chains into our CI CD pipelines so we can automate our diagram generation. For the C4 model, in terms of this tooling, uh, there's something called C4 Plant UML. This is a set of open source macros for the Plant UML tooling. You include them. Uh, oops. I pressed the wrong button. You include them uh, via some exclamation mark include statements. And then C4 Plant UML allows you to craft up a diagram using a domain-specific type of language. In this case, we're creating a person and a software system with a relationship between them. And that gives us this wonderful little diagram at the bottom. And this is OK. It's like a, a better approach than many of the tools I've talked about already. But it still doesn't solve many of them. So for example, if you want to craft up two diagrams with this technique, a system context diagram and a container diagram, you have to create two text files. And you have to duplicate stuff across these two text files. What happens if you change the name of one of your user types on one diagram? Well, you have to change it on the other diagram. Now, yes, you can include things and, and create snippets for uh, inclusion and common elements. And you can use your global search to replace features of your IDEs to make this easier. but Essentially, the responsibility is on you as the diagram author. If you want to make some changes, you've got to make them everywhere. I want to shift the narrative away from diagramming and towards modeling. Now, this is a very dangerous thing to say, because we used to do modeling 20 years ago, and everybody ditched it because it was very big and bloated and heavyweight, and we threw it all away. And we shouldn't have done that. There is some stuff we did throw away, quite rightly, but the concept of modeling is very, very powerful. And what I want to do is I want to apply this in a nice, lightweight way that's compatible with the way many teams work today. So I generally earn my living by flying around the world and running architecture train courses. And when the pandemic hit, I had no work. 
like none. It all got canceled almost immediately. So I did a ton of surfing. I did a ton of uh, cycling, and I learned how to make proper coffee. I apologize, this coffee does have milk in. I get it. <laughs> so in addition to this, I had a lot of spare time, so I created some tooling uh, to craft up these architecture diagrams. And this is my Structurizer tooling. Now, I want to make this perfectly clear here. I do have a company called Structurizer, and we do have some paid stuff. I'm not going to talk about any of the paid stuff, which is over here, hidden away. See, hidden. I'm not going to talk about that. I'm going to talk about all of the free and open source tooling. So everything I'm about to show you today, you can use completely for free. And you can fork it, customize it, et cetera. So the main thing I'm going to be speaking about is called the Structurizer DSL. And it's a text-based, domain-specific language specifically targeted to creating C4 model diagrams. It's all open source, so you can go find this on GitHub. It's actually a wrapper for a library I wrote about five or six years ago called Structurizer for Java. So this is an entirely Java-based toolchain. And the difference here between uh, the Structurizer DSL and C4 Plant EML is rather than creating multiple text files to get multiple diagrams, you're crafting up a, a single model of your software architecture and generating multiple diagrams from that single source of the truth. So arguably, a better title for this talk would be Models as Code, but the problem with me putting this as a talk title is that it would never get accepted and no one would turn up because modeling is seen as horrible and evil and bad and I'm hopefully it's change your mind. So what's different about the Structurizer DSL? Uh, first of all, we're not talking about boxes and arrows, we're talking about proper domain concepts. So if you look at Plant UML, Plant UML has things like rectangle. So if you're using raw native Plant UML, it's just rectangle and arrow and that's not a particularly good way to craft up a software architecture diagram. C4 Plant UML, as I said, does provide you with some domain concepts, like person and system, but I, I want to take this a step further. So I'm also going to be, going to be adopting a very domain-specific language approach to this. So you'll see references to things like person and software system and container and component, and these are all words from the C4 model description. Number two is model-based. One of the things we always talk about in software development is don't repeat yourself. But when we're crafting up architecture diagrams, that's exactly what we're doing. We're copy-pasting boxes and lines from a Visio sheet to another one. So this is an example of the Structurizer DSL. Uh, what we're doing here is we're crafting up what's called a workspace. A workspace is nothing more than a wrapper for two things. Number one, a model. A model describes your elements and the relationships between those elements. And number two, a set of views. So what this example is showing you is essentially a model consisting of a user with the description user, I know, a software system with the description of software system, uh, a relationship between the user and the software system. So that's the model, that's the elements and the relationships. And then we're defining a view at the bottom here. And we're going to define a system context view for that software system. We're going to tell the DSL we want to include all of the default set of elements. What this does behind the scenes is it says, right, you want to include the software system and things linked to the software system and apply automatic layout. So that little bit of code gives you this wonderful looking two boxes and one arrow diagram. Now, of course, imagine this is our system context diagram and we want to pinch to zoom in to see what's inside the software system in terms of C4 model containers. What we do now is we extend and add to that single model. So now we're opening up some curly braces, much like you would with a programming language. We're defining two C4 model containers inside, nested inside that software system, a web application and a database. We now have two relationships that we're defining here. We have a link between the user and the web application, and the web application and the database. We're keeping our system context view, and we're adding a container view. Include star, in this case, says include all of the containers inside the software system and things they are linked to and apply automatic layout. So now this text gives us two diagrams. So now we're able to change the name of that user, regenerate the diagrams, and we can see those changes across all of our diagrams. Because this is model-based, we can start to do some quite interesting things here. And we can start to imply relationships that we don't need to describe explicitly. So in the first example I showed you, we defined a single relationship in the text, user to software system with a description of users, and that gave us this line. 
in the second definition I showed you, this line does not exist. But it's still creating the same arrow. And it's doing this because of something called an implied relationship. Because the user has a link to the software system, and the software system, uh, sorry, because the user has a link to the web application, and the web application lives inside the software system, there is an implied relationship between the user and the bigger uh, outer software system box. So that's being generated for us. Um, one of the things here is you can customize all of this logic to make it how you want to. So that's quite cool. Separation of content presentation is something else I really wanted to achieve with this tooling. I'm a big fan of like HTML and CSS, and particularly this book from a long, long time ago, the Zen of CSS Design, and it was kind of groundbreaking at the time because it gave you this very skeleton HTML page and then had like 30 different examples of how different you could make that HTML page look with just using CSS. And I want to apply the same thing for the software architecture diagrams. So here's the example I showed you before, and it's got some very boring gray boxes. This supports the concept of themes, so we add theme defaults to the bottom, and bam, we get blue boxes, different shapes now. This is also supported for things like deployment diagrams. So the C4 model also de uh, defines a deployment diagram. This is also supported by this tooling. The deployment diagram just shows you containers nested onto deployment nodes. I have created a bunch of themes uh, that include the Amazon icon set, the Azure icon set, the GCP icon set, et cetera, et cetera. So we can turn this very boring looking diagram into something like that just by using the pre-built themes. So this is a really nice example of how we're using the AWS icons in a much more meaningful and much more structured way, which I quite like. How do we do this? It's basically like CSS. So when you define all of your elements and relationships in the model, you can associate text-based tags with them, much like you would with uh, HTML elements and CSS classes. And then you define a bunch of styles, uh, one per tag, essentially. Uh, so here's a simple example again. To style this, we just add an element style for the software system tag. Uh, all of the elements get a set of default tags, so a software system element gets a software system tag, and we can change the background color, et cetera, et cetera. It's a bunch of stuff you can change. And there's support for lots of different shapes and colors and border styles, et cetera, et cetera. One of the nice things about separating content from presentation is you can change the presentation depending on your use case for these diagrams. So imagine we have this and we want to embed it in a presentation in a, in a PowerPoint slide, but there's lots of text. And although you want the text for sticking this diagram in Confluence, you don't necessarily want all of that detailed text when you're doing a presentation because it might be quite distracting. Well, just turn it off. So this is really, really easy to do with this tooling because you just say, I don't want to show descriptions, thank you, and it regenerates the diagram without those descriptions. That's something you can't really do in Visio without copying the whole diagram and taking all the descriptions down. And this leads me on to one of the really powerful features of all of this. This tooling is rendering tool, it's diagramming tool agnostic. So with the traditional approaches to diagrams as code like PlantUML, we're using the PlantUML DSL, the, the text-based format defined by the PlantUML tooling, or Mermaid, as an input to the diagram generation process. So in other words, this PlantUML code will only ever generate that one diagram. That's it. You're stuck with this tooling. You're stuck with that diagram. And if you don't like what the diagram looks like, you now have to take this and convert it to a completely different tool. With my approach, I'm using things like PlantUML and Mermaid not as input formats, but as output formats that we automatically generate during the diagram uh, automation process. So what we can do now is this little piece of Structurizer DSL text can actually generate all of these different types of diagrams in different types of tools. And the different types of tools, of course, all have different trade-offs. Some are uh, server-side rendered, some are client-side rendered, some are interactive, some are static PNG files, some are SVG files. Um, so there's a, a bunch of interesting tools that you can look at with this approach. One of the things you'll see with many kind of diagrams as code tools is they, they prefer automatic layout, and some people really like automatic layout. I don't. I, I always find automatic layout kind of puts boxes in the wrong place, and I want to move them around, and you can't because you get stuck. So my preference is to use manual layout for architecture diagrams. And again, that's something that this tool set gives you. Depending on the diagram renderer that you use, 
you can decide whether you want to use an automatic layout tool or a manual layout tool. That's entirely up to you. In terms of manual layout tooling, I have something I created over the past couple of years called Structurizer Lite. So this is a completely free version of my Structurizer web-based browser. This is essentially a Docker container. It's on Docker Hub. You pull it down. You start it up. You point it to a folder containing your Structurizer DSL file. You go to uh, localhost 8080 in your web browser, and it basically creates a bunch of diagrams for you on the fly. So the way many people use this tooling, of course, is they check their diagram source into source code control next to their code, along with the script to boot this thing up. And then they can view these interactive web-based, uh, browser-based diagrams on demand. So many of the example diagrams you would have seen so far are generated with my Structurizer web-based renderer. It's interactive. It's navigatable. If you have a system context diagram, uh, and you have a container diagram sitting underneath that software system, my tooling allows you to double-click and get to that container diagram. So it kind of implements that double-click to zoom type feature. And things like diagram keys, this is the diagram key here. Uh, this is generated completely automatically for you uh, based upon the, stags, uh, the, the, stags, the tags and the styles that you define as a part of your DSL uh, definition. The Structurizer renderer also provides a, a force-directed graph, like a, a, a D3JS force-directed graph, which is another really interesting way to visualize those same diagrams in a, in, a, in a visualization format that's much more concise. And I'll explain why that's a good thing later. And, and that's basically what you get. When you boot up Structurizer Lite, you get a nice diagram editor, and you see all your diagrams. You can zoom in, zoom out. There's support for tooltips and export to PNG and SVG. And there's a presentation mode and a whole bunch of other features you can look at. Again, that's all free. You can also embed Markdown and ASCII doc documentation alongside your diagrams. And actually, what you can do here is you can embed the live, dynamic, interactive diagrams inside your Markdown and ASCII doc files. And the Structurizer Lite renderer will render that documentation in a nice little kind of navigatable format. And there's uh, full text search and, and quick find and all that sort of stuff. I've also done the same thing for architecture decision records. If you've not looked up architecture decision records, definitely something I'd recommend teams look at. If you have a folder full of architecture decision records, you can literally point the Structurizer uh, DSL at that folder, and it will automatically parse the ADRs and craft them into a nice sort of kind of HTML uh, web-based microsite that you can navigate, full text search, etc. So that's one option. That's my Structurizer browser-based renderer for diagrams and Markdown ASCII doc documentation. But as I said, this whole tool is rendering tool agnostic. So some more stuff I built is called the Structurizer CLI, also on GitHub. It's also a bunch of Java code. This is essentially a wrapper for the DSL and the Java library, and also some exporters, which are also built in Java. And what you do is you pull down the CLI. There are a bunch of options for how you do that. And you can run the CLI, point it to your workspace definition, and say, I would like to export all of the views the finder here in Plant UML format. It runs through, finds all the views, and creates you a bunch of, in this case, .puml files. So these are kind of native raw Plant UML format, which you then pass through Plant UML to create your diagrams. So this is quite nice. Now this kind of puts you back into uh, the tool chain that you might have been using before if you're migrating from something like Plant UML. And all the diagrams look different. So there are, there's support out of the box for Plant UML, and that has a bunch of different shapes and uh, things it can do. There's support for C4 Plant UML. So the Structurizer CLI, the export functionality, will export C4 Plant UML definitions that you can then push through Plant UML. There's, ex there's an export format for graphs and dot, if that's a tool chain you like. There's also support for Mermaid. So GitHub has now supported uh, rendering mermaid diagrams in GitHub Markdown. So you can run all this tooling, create yourself a bunch of Markdown definitions, drop those in, sorry, generate a bunch of mermaid definitions. Uh, these tool names are all complicated. <laughs> generate a bunch of mermaid definitions, drop those into Markdown, and have those rendered in GitHub. There's a really nice tool, uh, nothing to do with me, it's called Ilograph, or Ilograph, uh, I L O Graph uh, com. And it's a really nice, again, browser-based tool that allows you to explore and navigate uh, a hierarchical data set. 
So I've created an export format for this tool. Uh, the actual data format it uses is a rather nasty looking YAML syntax. Please don't craft that by hand. But again, you can craft up your structure as a DSL, export that to Elograph, drop it here, and you get a nice way to navigate your uh, software architecture model. So that's what I mean by a rendering tool independent. You can take this one definition and export it to a bunch of different formats, and then you're kind of nicely in those tool chains. And again, you can get more fancier. Um, some of the different rendering tools offer different shapes and stuff like that. But there's more. There's always more, isn't there? Um, one of the big questions I get from specifically larger teams what is like, well, how does this tooling, and, and in more general, how does your C4 model work with real systems, like big, complicated systems? Because once you start having more than maybe 12 or 15 or 20 boxes on a diagram, all of your arrows start overlapping, and it gets very, very complicated very, very quickly. So let's imagine you have some sort of service-based architecture. And maybe you have like a user using a web application, and then there's a bunch of services sitting behind your web application. Imagine this was not four services. Imagine this was like 40 or 400 services. This diagram is now going to start getting very, very ugly. So how do we fix this? Bunch of options. Option number one, rather than drawing one diagram showing all four services, maybe we draw four diagrams, each showing one service. So maybe we can do something like this. Maybe we craft up one diagram that focuses on service one and things connected to and from service one, and similarly with service two and three and four. Do this with Visio, and of course it's hard. You have to start copying and pasting elements across all of your different diagrams. With the Structurizer DSL, because it's model-based, it's really simple. Four lines of code will give you that diagram. So what we're saying here is we're saying create a container diagram for that software system, include the user, include service one, and service one is the combination of the API and the data store in this case, include things going into service one, and things coming out of service one, and apply auto automatic layout. So those four lines give you that diagram. So this is a really nice way to kind of slice and dice your, your model and create different views of uh, that model to tell the stories that you want to tell. Because all of this stuff works before the diagram rendering stage, uh, this is applicable to all of the export formats as well. So you craft up your DSL file, you push it through PlantUML, and you can get uh, a kind of partition or slice diagram uh, using the PlantUML rendering engine as well. To, um, to do service two, you do the same thing. So this is a really nice, quick way to generate a bunch of diagrams very, very quickly. So that's kind of option one for dealing with really big, complicated software systems. Option two is to use a different visualization format. And this is why the Structurizer renderer, the, the, the free Docker uh, version, includes this force directed graph. So this is interactive. You can click on a node and drag node around. And if you click on a node, it will show you what it's directly connected to. There's support for kind of hover over tooltips. So this is a really nice data format. It's a really nice visualization format for showing larger volumes of data where you want to maybe ask questions like, if we change service one, what's the impact? Or you could use the Elograph tooling. So you craft up your Structurizer DSL. You run the export to Elograph. You copy paste the massive YAML file onto the left hand side there, and you get this really nice interactive uh, visualization engine. If you were to click that Service 2 API box, again, this is all nice and interactive and it's kind of all zoomy and stuff, but it basically does this and kind of says, Oh, you want to see Service 2? Boom, it kind of puts that in the middle. So, again, this is a really nice uh, visualization engine for uh, kind of bigger, more complicated architectures. How do you do lots of systems? You know, this is great for a single team, but how do you maybe reuse some of this information across multiple teams, across multiple systems? Well, there is support for uh, things like workspace extension. So what you can do is you can craft up uh, a, a definition of all of your people and your software systems, maybe across a department in your organization, and then you can extend that definition so you reuse the people and the software systems, but you're, you're creating C4 model drill-down diagrams per software system that you want more detail on. So that's all something that's also supported kind of straight out of the box. Earlier uh, last year, or, or uh, sorry, earlier this year, or maybe end of last year, 
I added support for JSR223, the JavaScripting API. So what you can do now is you can take your DSL file and you can stick in a Groovy or a Kotlin or a JRuby or a JavaScript Rhino script if you're using a VM that supports it still. Um, you can embed a little script in there. And you're like, why? Because the DSL does lots of things for you, but there may be some features of the underlying structurizer for Java library that you can't quite get to. So you can open up a little script, um, and you can just do something like create me all the default views, but turn off automatic layout. Uh, you can have scripts in line. You can have scripts in external files. There's also support for things like plugins. So there's a little Java interface you can um, uh, implement. Stick that on the class path, uh, add it to a, a plugins folder in this case, and you can have complete access to the underlying structurizer for Java library. You can also do things like use both. So you could use the DSL and use the underlying Java library, and you might be thinking, why? What's the point in writing actual Java code to start generating diagrams? So maybe, let's imagine we're crafting up our DSL workspace, and we're saying we've got a user using a, a, a web application that might be the level of detail that we want to hand craft in our DSL definition. But of course, inside that web application sits a bunch of components. And maybe there are lots of components, and we don't want to hand craft the list of all of those components and the relationships between them. So maybe we have this as our DSL file, and then we write a separate Java program. We add a dependency onto the, the structurizer DSL parser. It's all on Maven Central, of course. And we basically say, parse the workspace definition go and find the container that's named web application that sits under that software system, and now write some code to go and find components magically using introspection, reflection, um, source code analysis, whatever technique you want to use, and then craft up a container view showing all of that detail. So this is a really interesting uh, way to do kind of diagrams as data. You're essentially auto-generating parts of your overall software architecture model from things like your source code or things like your Terraform definitions, or your CloudFormation definitions, or maybe you're pointing some code at your AWS account and extracting out information about your real target deployment environment. So that's a really nice way to kind of use this in a hybrid approach. Uh, how do people use this type of tooling? To be fair, the majority of people, the majority of teams that I see using this are handcrafting DSL files. And what they're normally doing is they're drawing high-level system context diagrams and slightly more detailed container diagrams. And because this information is kind of hard to extract from a real code base, it's often easier just to handcraft these DSL definitions. So that's what I see uh, people doing the most. Again, with the hybrid approach, with the Java library or being on Maven Central, you can do more diagrams as data type stuff. So if you have an internal data source, maybe you have an internal service catalog that has a list or is a repository of all of the systems or services that are deployed in production in your environment, Maybe you could write a parser to pull that information down and use that to craft up like a system landscape diagram. So this is, again, it's a really interesting way to start leveraging existing data sources within your organization rather than starting uh, handcrafting the same information in a separate text file. Most people still, unfortunately, want static diagrams. They want PNG files and SVG files to stick in SharePoint and Confluence and GitHub markdown pages. That's fine. There's a whole bunch of ways you can generate PNG and SVG files out of this tool chain with the different diagram rendering engines. I'm a big fan of interactive diagrams. I really want us to start moving away from PNG and SVG files and really using the interactive nature of the web browsers that we have. Because you can embed much more information behind that model. You can embed metadata. You can do things like views and perspectives, if you're familiar with Owen Woods and Nick Rosansky's book, uh, Software Systems Architecture. So there's a way to, to kind of do those sorts of things with an interactive diagram. If you want to view your architecture model from a security perspective, you could define that security perspective on your model and then have a way to kind of filter out anything that doesn't have security information attached to it. You can do reviews on interactive diagrams. You can do presentations with interactive diagrams. You can animate uh, some of these diagrams because they are, by nature, interactive. So that's, I, I think there's lots more interesting stuff we can do here, and especially when you have those larger models, those larger data sets, something like an interactive uh, D3JS force directed graph is potentially a much better approach than just using a bunch of static images in a markdown file. Some closing thoughts to kind of wrap this up before we are uh, open for a few questions, hopefully. Diagrams of code is awesome. It's very 
easy for us as software developers to, to kind of get into. The barrier to entry is very, very low. The majority of the tooling around this is open source. Plant UML, Mermaid, Graph is dot, et cetera, et cetera, is all open source. These things are easy to diff. So you can include your diagrams and your documentation if you're doing things like Docs code in your pull requests. So now your pull request has your feature change, your doc change, and your diagram change. And now somebody can review that entire thing, so making sure you're keeping your diagrams and documentation up to date when you make a change. And because a lot of this is automatable, because you can ins install the tools on your CI CD server, it's much easier to automatically generate these diagrams uh, as a part of your build process. So diagrams as code is an awesome technique. My approach here, which I'm calling diagrams as code 2, which is really models as code, of course, um, does make this model-based. So we're now reusing elements and relationships across multiple diagrams so we get better consistency. And uh, we're separating content from presentation through that diagram uh, rendering tool agnostic approach, which is interesting because now it allows us to plug in our own rendering tool in the future. If there's a, a specific uh, way we want to visualize our model, visualize our diagrams, we can absolutely do that, of course. The problem with uh, general purpose diagramming tools is because you spend so long lining the boxes up, we get attached to our diagrams. And it, imagine you spent like four hours lining up your diagram elements and making all your arrows straight, and then you show it to someone, they're like, but you missed something. You're like, oh, come on. And you just don't want to change it because you've, you've, you've spent four hours making all the arrows straight, and you have to go change your diagram. I want to get us out of this mindset. For me, the diagrams are super powerful. But for me, I want to just use the diagrams as a way to tell stories and, and potentially just have those things as being disposable artifacts that are easy to recreate if we need them. The downside of this approach, so this is not a silver bullet, of course. The downside, the major downside of this approach is it's not very accessible to non-developers. So anything with as code in the title is going to put off non-developers. To be fair, I'm specifically targeting this tooling at developers. People say, Simon, who should be drawing architecture diagrams on a team? And my answer is it really should be the software development team. And sometimes you'll get these kind of non-coding architects who want to get into this tooling, and they don't know how to do it because they're non-coding architects. This tooling is not for them. So that can um, put people off using it, of course. In terms of where do you keep the stuff, I would stick all of your diagrams and documentation as code next to your live production code in source code control. And then it's all in one place. And again, as I said, you can uh, include it in your pull requests. And if you want non-developers and non-team members who need access to this stuff, well, you publish it. So you take all of your markdown files with your PNG SVG diagrams, and you use MKDocs or Hugo to go generate a static website. Or you uh, publish this to um, so with the Structurizer Lite thing, you can run that Docker container on a CI-CD uh, environment. So you can craft up a URL and just send people to that URL. You can kind of publish this information to that, to that server. So there's a bunch of interesting ways you can push this information to a wider audience. People often ask me, is this tooling suitable for doing upfront design or longer-lived documentation? And my answer is, you can use it for both. But really, for me, this tooling comes into its own for longer-lived documentation. When I'm doing things like upfront design, I'm going to use a big whiteboard or a big sheet of paper because it's just a much more collaborative way to do things like pair architecting. I'm a big fan of pair architecting. So I would tend to use this tooling as a documentation tool set rather than a design tool set. But you could do if you want to. So if, all the, if this sounds very interesting, thing, I want to give that a go. Uh, if on the uh, GitHub repo for the DSL, there's a little cookbook that I started to uh, write. And it basically has like a how do I create a system context view, and there's a nice little bunch of examples on there. It's all interactive. You can click on any of the diagrams on the Markdown page, and it will take you to a live version of the DSL that's kind of powering that diagram. So there's a bunch of little recipes in there for doing bits and pieces. And if you want to try this tooling out without installing anything, you can go to structurizer.com slash DSL, and there's a little demo page on there. It gives you a text editor on the left. It does some basic syntax highlighting, but that's it. Don't expect auto-completion or anything like that. So some basic syntax highlighting, text on, on the, right, the left-hand side there. You type your text, click the render button, and then you get your diagram on the right-hand side here. You'll notice there are a bunch of tabs across the top. 
So this diagram here is the web-based Structurizer renderer, the same one that you find in Structurizer Lite. The graph is also built on this demo page, and then you have all of the exports for plant UML, C4 plant UML, Mermaid, Dot, Illograph, et cetera. So rather than installing the CLI, uh, you can just use this tool and grab those export formats. And that is that. Thank you very much. Obrigado. <laughs> So, does anybody has a question? Please raise your hand. Uh, do I have uh, integration? Please repeat your, repeat the your question. Yeah. So, do I have uh, integration with the ASCII doc diagram? Um, kind of is the answer. So, um, there's a, a bunch of tooling called Crocky. Crokey. I don't know how you pronounce it. Uh, that tool set, however you pronounce it, has just added support for the Structurizer DSL. Uh, and it will give you, I think it's the plant UML version of the diagram. So, so kind of, there is some integration there, yes. But it's not going to give you everything you've seen here. So I, I think some of that question is like, how do, you, how do you kind of better integrate this with your actual source code? Um, are you thinking about auto-generating auto diagrams from your source code, for example? So um, as I said before, there's a library called Structurizer for Java, which is basically sitting behind all this tooling. Uh, there's a, a Java extensions library. Uh, there's also on GitHub. Uh, in that extensions library, there's something called a component finder. And the component finder uh, is a way to go and find components in a production code base. How does it find components? Well, there are a bunch of different pluggable strategies you can use. So for example, if you're building a Spring app, you can basically say, uh, go and find all of the, the code elements in my code base that are annotated with at controller or at repository or at components. And then the component finder will kind of find these things, figure out what's a part of those components using the typical Spring naming conventions, kind of call that thing a component, and then find relationships between components. So yeah, you could do things like this. You could integrate this tooling with your, your Java code base. And of course, you could build your own custom annotations to add into your production code base, and then write some tooling to go find those annotations, and then drop them into this model. So yeah, there's a bunch of tie-ins you can do here. It is going to require some effort on your behalf, though, because all code bases look different, of course. If you have a question, please keep your, your hand up. Here. Come on, wait for five seconds, three <laughs> seconds. Here you go. So uh, on an enterprise that you have uh, dozens of teams, dozens of repositories, uh, from what I understood, maybe you'd, you'd use something like the, the, the extensions of workspace and all that. But even then, uh, I'm wondering how does, does the extensions have support for, like, type checking or something like that, that you would know, how do they know what exists on the higher level uh, and, and how to collaborate on that, on, on, on such a, a big enterprise, yeah. Yeah, so when, when you're extending a workspace, you essentially get access to everything that's defined in that, in that um, previous upper uh, level workspace. Um, and the DSL parser, when it, when it parses your, uh, when it passes the workspace, the, the one that you're crafting up to extend, um, there's lots of checking done at parse time. So it, it, will, it will try and find links to uh, elements and relationships already defined. And it will know to do the right thing when you say, I would like to add containers to a software system that's already defined in my, in my kind of super workspace. So, so yeah, that's kind of all built in. So it, it's, it shouldn't be possible to craft up an, an inconsistent model when you're splitting across multiple files. The other thing you can do is the Structurizer DSL supply, uh, provides support for like an exclam exclamation mark include feature. So you can also use includes in conjunction with things like extensions if you want to uh, achieve reuse in a slightly different way. So yeah, that's all taken care of because it's model-based, it kind of knows what's going on. Um, and uh, I'm wondering, you talked also about uh, 
being more dynamic, being browser-based and all that, the, the, the diagrams. Do you plan to do something like uh, really drilling down, I don't know, having from the, diff the different levels being able to drill down between one another and, and all that, giving that uh, interactivity? So, yeah, my, my structure is a light browser-based uh, rendering engine actually does that. So you can look at a system context diagram, uh, and you can double-click on a system, and it will take you to the container diagram. And then you can choose a container, double-click, and it will take you to the component diagram. So that, that's all built into um, my Structurizer uh, rendering engine. That's free, but it's not open source. If you want something that's open source, there's a project called C4Viz, V-I-Z. And that's basically a copy of my Structurizer Lite UI, except what it's doing is it's exporting diagrams to C4 plant UML format. So, so what, what you do is, is you boot this thing up, you point it at your workspace, it renders all the diagrams to C4 plant UML format uh, in SVG, and then it kind of throws those at you through the browser, and it hyperlinks the various elements together on the SVG document. So you can, you can click an element, and it takes you to the same thing. You can kind of zoom in. So C4Viz is another approach to visualizing this in an interactive way. OK. Um, I think the main struggle here for me to understand is actually how we so we have a bunch of different repositories that they can represent one or more systems, right? And if you are in a high level diagram and you want to drill down to a specific container, now that documentation is in a different repository, right? So we need some kind of I don't know, C I C D pipeline to gather all this information to build it up together, or is there any other alternative for this? Yeah, it's, it's a good question, and you have a bunch of options is the kind of short answer here. So one of the things I, I find quite entertaining about many large organizations is they want autonomy, and they want teams to be like completely independent, yet they want a single source of all their diagrams. They want one diagram that shows like, all of the teams, all the systems, and how they interact. So that, that's kind of an interesting conflict there, but let's assume that's, that's what, you, what you want to do for a bunch of reasons. Option one is you have a, you, you pull all of the diagrams and documentation into a separate single repository. Uh, that's the simpler approach. But of course, now when you're making changes to your production code base, you've now got to make sure you update the diagrams and documentation in that centralized repository. So there are some trade offs. Option two is you craft up your landscape in a separate repository. And then you, so with, my Structurizer light tooling, you can, you can add hyperlinks to any elements. So what you can do is you can add a bunch of hyperlinks so that when you double click, you're not taken to the next level down, you're taken to a separate workspace and running, maybe running on a separate version of Structurizer light running on a separate server. So maybe the answer here is to, to craft up a bunch of independent documentation and hyperlink them together via a centralized kind of map of your system. So that's another option here, and it has its own trade-offs. Because this is all automatable, you can have all the stuff in many repositories and pull it together as part of your book process. OK. Or we could develop a diagram discovery service. You could absolutely, yeah, you could absolutely do that as well. Um, craft up that definition into this format, and then you have access to all of the downstream rendering tools. Yeah. OK, OK. Have if it? you are online, Please, you are able to write down your question. I'm tracking here as well. Please, go ahead. Just one, sorry, if we're taking over this. Um, have you seen uh, the need f to an even higher level uh, diagram rather than the system context? Because we have struggled <laughs> with that in the yep. past, even. There's a lot of systems um, in, our, in, our code, in our enterprise. Uh, yes, absolutely. So the C4 model, although it's context, containers, components, code, uh, there's kind of a system landscape diagram that sits on top. It's not really on top. It's, it's really just a system context diagram with more systems and more people. So that's one of the things I see big organizations doing. They're crafting up a map of their systems um, and then doing individual C4 model drill downs for each system. How they come up with that landscape diagram, they're either doing what you said, so they're, they're automatically generating it based upon system catalogs or service catalogs. Um, so that, that, that's kind of the approach there. To kind of more fully answer the question, yes, I've seen organizations want even high levels of diagrams that focus more on 
business services and business capabilities. So maybe you've got like a single service capability, which is implemented by a bunch of systems. So you might want to go even one higher level up and kind of start grouping systems um, and show how they support that service or capability. So yeah, it's, it's all about the level of Zoom you're interested in, essentially. OK, does anybody else have more questions? Please raise one, your hand. OK. One at the back there. There's lots of walking going now on the microphone. <laughs> Good morning. morning. Um, I had a question. Does it have any compatibility with the um, XTEX um, converted language? So I am with XTEX grammatically made language. So I have um, DSL made XTEX language, and I wanted to see if I could use this tool to produce the diagrams on an IDE browser that I'm making also. Yeah, uh, so short answer from me, no. OK. But again, uh, so the, the actual data structure that sits behind this tooling is an open API. It's a, it's a JSON document, kind of mm -hmm. JSON schema. So you could craft up your DSL and then write yourself a renderer to something like XTEX if you want to. OK, thank you. OK, is there more questions? We should have a couple of seconds. Uh, se você está com vergonha de falar inglês, ou não fala inglês, fala em português, que nós traduzimos para o inglês também. Tá? É uma opção. Uh, give once. Give twice. We've got 20 seconds, 19. <laughs> <laughs> we still have a couple of seconds, but here you go. Thank you, Simon. Thank you. That was a great Obrigado. presentation. <laughs>